we're probably going to pack out, so I need you to all move. Thank you. So is Lee still in the station? just because this is going to be filmed so anyone coming in and having to stand up it's going to be really really just dis uh, disruptive thank you and um, I've also put up the Slido code so for those of you who weren't here yesterday Slido is the way we're operating our questioning system so <coughs> each speaker will have 15 minutes to persuade you of their point of view during that time please send us your questions please also vote in the poll now so we get an idea of what the pre-argument consensus is and see if any of these speakers can make you change your mind. Thank you. Are you happy with 15 minutes each? We'll open the floor for questions. Great. I'll throw a squeezy brain at you if you go on for too long. Yeah, please, please. Yeah. I'm not very good at Below the net. Below the net. No concussions. No concussions. Or else. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure you would. Okay, welcome everyone. The second debate. Um, hopefully, most of you uh, were here yesterday, so know how it works. If you were not here, uh, log on to Slido S L I dot D O. Uh, put in our um, tag which is FITB17, capital F, small i, capital TBI17. All right, and today's question is, should we retire the term concussion? Okay, so um, proposing four is Professor David Sharp uh, from the Imperial Group. Um, He's already published a paper saying concussion is confusing us all. Uh, therefore, he strongly believes that we should be retiring that term. Uh, and then uh, proposing that we should keep using the term concussion uh, is Professor Lee Goldstein. Uh, we've already seen him talk uh, yesterday. Uh, so he is a professor of psychiatry and neurology uh, from Boston University. And as we saw from his work yesterday, he's done lots of work uh, with animal models, especially of BLAST, TBI, uh, and also of neurodegeneration. So um, just before we start, so again, uh, each uh, 
a person from the debate will get 15 minutes. Uh, you can send in your questions through Slido. Uh, so we will take some of those questions and take some uh, questions from the audience. And then they'll have five minutes rebuttal at the end. Hopefully, it won't get aggressive. Um, and um, just, yeah, hopefully, we <laughs> maybe it will. <laughs> um, so interestingly, we are not polarized like yesterday. So 37% uh, of us think yes, 37% of us think no, and 26% of us aren't thinking. So um, <laughs> let us start. Thanks, Pete. So I'd like to point out that Pete was my co-author on the paper. So, yeah, so our chairman is not independent in this. So Mark was quite clear that he, did, he believed nothing of what he said yesterday, but I'd like to make it clear that I do believe at least most of what I'm going to say to you. Um, so, um, so concussion, what a, what a mess. What a, what a big problem we've got, I think, with, with concussion. Um, so in the run-up to this, I thought I'd do a straw poll of Lee, David, Brody, you know, myself. Um, and we all actually think completely different things about what concussion means. And I suspect... Most of us have thought a bit about it. I mean, so David's written a textbook on it. You know, so, uh, um, you know, we've all spent time thinking about it. But actually, we have different definitions. So there is, if we have a problem with definitions, if we can't agree among ourselves, then that's a big problem, I think, in the field, and it's a big problem generally. So as Pete said, I have um, written um, a paper on, uh, um, on this. So it's available, free to download. If you want some lecture notes on this, you can download it, have a look at it. So concussion is confusing us all. So I suppose at the heart of my problem is that I think it's dam the term concussion is damaging us because it's so confusing. Um, and the, the people centrally involved in the research in this area can't agree on what it is. Um, and then as you go further and further out, concussion becomes more and more problematic. And so you reach down onto the playing fields, into the military, and nobody actually knows what the term means, what the edges are of this. Um, and you might think this is a, a rather pedantic um, academic debate, uh, and that's one kind of uh, approach to it. But what I'm going to try and do is, is show you why I think it matters and why I think as a community we should move towards a situation where we agree on the definitions of these issues. And I think the easiest thing with concussion would be to, uh, to get rid of it. <coughs> so I could have put lots of, con lots of definitions of concussion, but I think this is probably at the heart of what people think about in terms of concussion. So I think it's used to describe a patient who's briefly disabled by a head injury with the assumption that this was due to a transient disorder of brain function without pathology and without long-term effects. And I think that many people who like the term concussion like it because it's saying something about that. And if you, just, on, just in that, I would have some major problems with this. Um, so that it's a transient disorder of brain function, first of all. So I don't think it's just the brain. This is a head injury. There are many different things in the head. Um, as we know, that can contribute to the symptoms that are associated with concussion. And I think that's a, a, an important issue. Um, I don't think it's necessarily transient. I don't think it's necessarily without pathology. And I don't think it's necessarily without long-term effects. Um, so all of those issues I have a major problem with. Um, and, uh, and, that's, and the term concussion comes with an awful lot of baggage. And actually, this baggage is culturally varying. You know, as David was pointing out to me, in America, concussion, I think, has a much more serious connotation than it does perhaps in other parts of the world. And so that variability and actually what it means socially and culturally in different contexts is, uh, is problematic. So I think we have a major confusion generally in the field um, about the term concussion and about how it relates, relates to the term traumatic brain injury. Um, and how it relates to long-term effects. And I think this is causing social problems, medical problems, pu public health problems. Um, and actually, you know, these issues are very, very controversial. You know, I mean, many, many people are interested in this, and there's an awful lot of debate about it. So it's not that this is an esoteric, purely academic, kind of navel-gazing exercise. I mean, what we say has, um, you know, large, large effects, I think, in many ways. Um, so, if we think about the actual definitions, so this is the um, uh, concussion in sport um, kind of attempt to define things. So every few years, they have a big, you know, shindig where they all get together, funded by FIFA, I think, and various other august, um, you know, sporting <laughs> bodies. Um, and they get together and they spend a long time kind of talking about what concussion is. 
you know, and in the end, as I understand it, I've not been, but I understand that in the end, not everybody, some people go into a room with all the FIFA officials and then they decide what the definition is. <laughs> um, and this, does, this sounds slightly anti, you know, academic um, and anti-scientific, really, uh, prone perhaps to some conflicts of interest there. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and I think, you know, and, the, and the last, we, we are waiting for the latest Berlin guidelines to come out, which I gather are changing the definition. But the 2012 Zurich consensus was that um, TBI was distinct from uh, sorry, the, the concussion was distinct from traumatic brain injury. This was a different disease. Um, there was a complex pathophysiological process. There was possible pathology. It was a functional disturbance, whatever that means. Um, and there was sponta spontaneous resolution with no imaging abnormality. So at the heart of it still is this idea, actually, that this is, this is, this is not really that problematic. It's going to go away. It's a transient thing. You don't need to worry about it that much. Now, about the same time, the American Academy of Neurology took a quite different view on this um, and said that this was not distinct from traumatic brain injury and that this was a neurological syndrome um, and that it typically affected memory and attention. Um, and, so the, uh, and actually, you know, the, the, the Zurich Consensus Guidelines has an enormous reach. I mean, the, you know, the sporting bodies are engaged with that. It's not that it's, this, is a, this doesn't have any impact. This filters down to all levels of sport across the whole world. I mean, I think it has a tremendous impact, actually. You know, so the fact that it's, it's taking a completely different um, uh, position to you know, the, the, the largest neurological kind of body that's uh, um, uh, pronouncing on this is very problematic. Um, so... There's lots of interest in this kind of area. This was actually in relation to, I don't know whether Senior Fussell's here, but this was in relation to a paper of ours that came out last year. I was lucky enough to work with Senior's group on. Um, but it was showing that paediatric injuries have many long-term problems. Um, and this was the mirror's response. Millions of Brits face dying early because of something they did when they were children. Uh, and this is, you know incredibly vague, isn't it? Incredibly kind of ill-defined and kind of, you know, sums up, I suppose, both the interest and the, and the lack of kind of rigour in the way this is discussed, really. Um, this is an example of the confusion on the ground, I think. Uh, um, so this was the World Cup final um, uh, in, um, in Brazil. Uh, it was Argentina um, uh, against Germany. And this was Christoph Kramer, who's a German defender. And about halfway through the, um, uh, the first half, he collided with um, uh, Ezekiel Garay's knee, one of the Argentinians, and was knocked out cold. Um, and, uh, and the remarkable thing is that he just carried on playing for about 15 minutes. When, when I say playing, he carried on wandering around the field. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and at one point, he went up to the, um, the referee um, who's an Italian, uh, and said, ref, is this the World Cup final? <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the referee subsequently was interviewed by um, Corriere della Sport in, in, in Italy. So this comes from the referee. The referee said, yeah, he came up to me, asked me if this was the final. Um, and the referee said, yeah, it's, this is the World Cup final. And, and the guy went, Oh, thanks. Okay, and he and he carried on, you know. So he, so he just and he, and he carried on, sort of stumbling around the pitch for a bit, and then after about fifteen minutes, he was brought off. Um, and this was this was, you know, this was a couple of years ago in the most high-profile sporting event in the world, you know, which kind of sums up, I think, probably where we are in terms of the, uh, the, the level of confusion about what concussion might or might not be and what maybe they should or should not do about it. I mean, I suspect this wouldn't, this certainly wouldn't happen in an RFU game here and it wouldn't happen in the NFL, I imagine, but um, it would happen on the ground, on, you know, in, in sporting pitches with our kids being exposed to these things very frequently. Um, okay, so... So we have kind of three ways, I think, that the term concussion is used. Um, first of all, it's used as a diagnosis. Um, so, for example, somebody's had a concussion, and that can be thought of as distinct. Or, and something I particularly hate, um, they have post-concussive syndrome, and I'll come back to that. Um, Secondly, as a neurological syndrome, so this is a collection of symptoms um, that I suppose reflects an underlying diagnosis. Um, and thirdly, as a, as a lay term, which you know, I think there's value in its use as a lay term because people kind of know what it means and uh, um, is useful as a communication uh, device. But, so what I'm proposing is that we retire the first two of these um, in academic kind of neurological medical use. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to go through why I think that that's useful or why we could do that.
Um, so in terms of classification, just to be clear, I think so, so, so the first of these, of these usages would be something like this. We would have um, uh, 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 some kind of um, classification of traumatic brain injury severity, which might have mild, moderate, or severe, with increasing levels of structural damage. And then completely separately, we have something called concussion that's not traumatic brain injury, and there's no structural damage there. So this is a distinct condition with its own diagnostic and management implications, seen mainly in the context of sport. Really? Does anybody really think that? You know, when you, you know, I mean, it's, is, that, is that possible? I mean, it seems incredible that that, that should be a possibility, but, but I think that is, you know, the, the, the kind of extension of some of the, the guidelines that are coming out. Um, now, the problem, one of the problems here is symptomatology. Um, right, so this is essentially defined on symptoms, this idea. Um, and, and if you look at the symptoms, this is taken from the Zurich Consensus Guidelines. Um, so headache, dizziness, sleep disturbance, cognitive impairments, fatigue, irritability, anxiety, depression. Now, when we put this slide together for our paper, Pete cleverly repeated all of those symptoms um, on the other side there, because actually there's no difference. You know, our patients have those symptoms. You know, there's a complete overlap. It's not possible to distinguish on symptomological grounds um, between the symptoms of a concussion and the symptoms that are attributed to a traumatic brain injury. Um, and, you know, within the severity of these, you know, mild TBI, moderate, you know, they might have the same symptoms, you know, to differing degrees. It's, it's very difficult. There's a very complicated mapping there. So I think from a symptomatic point of view, it's not possible to, to, to separate these things. Um, Okay, so what about biomechanics? So as we've been kind of talking about a lot in the conference, I think one of the exciting areas of what's going on is that, you know, TBI can be viewed as a biomechanical problem. You know, it is an intersection between a particular biomechanical mechanical force and the brain. Um, and we can model that. Um, uh, so this is Mazdaq's beautiful kind of modeling. An American football hit, somebody who might get a, con a concussion, um, a fall backwards, a road traffic accident with different patterns of strain. Now, the point I'd like to make here is that the brain doesn't know what the force is that's, you know, that's actually caused the force. It doesn't care whether it was a football hit or a fall. Or, you know, but this is a, this is a biomechanical um, kind of event. So in addition to not being able to distinguish it on symptomatic grounds, I don't think you can distinguish it on, um, uh, on biomechanical grounds. Um, you know, there's no way that we can disentangle whether this particular pattern of force came from um, a, a, an impact or a fall, which might produce very, very similar biomechanics, actually. Um, so I think at the level of the brain, it's also very problematic to try and separate this thing. Now, this is, I, I thought I'd get my attack in early, um, Lee. And uh, um, so this is a mouse. Um, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I don't do much mouse work, but I've noticed a few differences between mice and men. Yeah, and uh, I don't think the mice talk. Um, so I, I think defining concussion on the basis of the mouse um, your, the, your work is beautiful. You know, I, I, love, I love the model. I love the events. But, but, to, but you know, if we're extrapolating from that into, into humans, I, I think there are some problems with that. You know? and, uh, um, and I think we, we can only go so far with, with, with the mouse work. Um, so I don't know exactly what you're going to argue, but... Uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah. I changed it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we, I think we only need... We, we just need a, a single system for um, estimating the severity of a traumatic brain injury. Um, and we, we have systems for doing that. The system that I, would, I like and use is the Mayo classification system. Um, uh, you know, if you read the paper, which is very good, it acknowledges all of the problems of TBI classification, all of the uncertainties we have. Maybe we don't have the GCS or we don't have the PTA, or whatever it is. You know, it acknowledges that. And that's built into the system. So, for example, we've got a symptomatic possible group here based on symptoms. We acknowledge that for some of our patients, they have a lot of symptoms. We don't know whether they've had a traumatic brain injury, so we call them symptomatic possible. Um, if there are a few more signifiers of injury, we call it mild probable, and then there's a group of moderate severe injuries where we think they definitely had a traumatic brain injury. Uh, and I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, approach. Um, I think 
the term mild in this context, as you know, D David has pointed out to me, um, is potentially problematic for our patients. Patients may not like to be told they've had a mild injury. And that is a, that is a, a potential issue. But I think in terms of you know, having a standardized system that we could all buy into, this is a reasonable um, attempt. Um, OK, so actually David's um, preference, I think, um, is to use the word concussion for this mild group. So it's a replacement um, for um, the mild part of the spectrum. So you might say somebody's had a, um, a concussive traumatic brain injury or just a concussion, um, which you know, I have a lot less problems with than, than, than separating it from, uh, from traumatic brain injury. But I'd like to point out one or two um, issues with that. Um, so part of the problem is, um, is using it as a syndrome in that context. So we're using it as a catch-all um, to describe the symptoms that, uh, that people have. Now, one, one thing is I don't think we really need it. You know, so what we can do is describe the kind of problems a little bit more precisely. So at the heart of traumatic brain injury uh, or concussion is the idea that you have a cognitive disturbance, I think. Um, and at the heart of that is a memory problem and a disorientation. Um, which is kind of at the, you know, at the heart of what many of the problems here are, a variable duration. Now we have a term that we use um, routinely to describe memory difficulties after a head injury, and that's post-traumatic amnesia. Um, now, this is widely used. We have ways of assessing it. It's, it's validated. It can be quantified on the ward. It can be shown to relate to outcomes. You know, so part of you know, what is concussion, I think, is the cognitive impairments that we have other kind of terms that we can use to describe, which are less problematic, um, more widely used, more validated. So I'm not saying that this is all of concussion. I'm just saying that part of it, you know, can be described by this term, and other parts can be described by other terms, which I'm not going to go into. Okay, so, um, so now I'm going to come into the, the, the point about the head having different bits. Right, which, and obviously this is a very stupid point in some ways, but I think it's kind of overlooked, you know, because sometimes we just focus on the brain. Everything's about TBI. Um, and the problem is that concussion um, symptomatologically, so, so for example, the dizziness part of concussion may well not be coming from the brain. Um, it can be coming from other, um, other parts. Um, so for example, it might involve a brain dysfunction. It might involve a vestibular problem. And the vestibular problems are very, very common. It's not that these are uncommon. They're really common after an injury. Um, and we need to remember that. The pain might be coming from the scalp or the skull or the dura. You might have autonomic problems associated with the injury. Um, and actually, Separating those out is really important, I think, and it's really, you know, it would be a standard kind of practice medically. Um, and I just want to show um, how difficult I, I think this is. Um, so this is one of Simon's lovely videos that I think he showed yesterday, probably. Um, uh, and this is a, a rugby match. Now, in this context, I think the RFU have done a great job with trying to define um, uh, the players who are at risk of, of ongoing problems. And here, you know, it's the best possible setup. We've got multiple cameras. You can kind of zoom in. They have a medical team. They're looking at it. And I just want to show the, um, this example here, if it will play. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so you've got to watch the guy who was uh, who's arrowed there, and then he's, he, he has a he has a hit there, gets up, and then the point is here is he should be in line, and then he wanders off a little bit. He stumbles a bit. He gets up, and then he's probably you know maybe getting back to normal at this stage. Now, the, the point I want to make about that is, is not that that's not problematic. I mean, that's a, very, that's a worrying event that previously would have been missed. I mean, you know, prior to a few years ago, that would have been missed because it wasn't really being looked for. But the point I want to make about it is that although you might think that's definitely a, a brain injury, is, that, you know, is it coming from the brain? I don't know whether it's coming from a brain. As a neurologist looking at that, I wonder whether that's coming from something else. I wonder whether he's got a transient vestibular problem at that stage. Um, and, and so even if you take the most 
kind of um, the most clear-cut situations where we have very clear, you know, uh, imaging or uh, video evidence of what's going on, it can be very difficult, I think, to disentangle that. So if you're seeing a patient an hour later, a month later, 10 years later after these events, I mean, really, you've got no real way of being sure about what's happened at the time of the injury. Um, and, and, and that's important. Um, so I want to make an analogy here, which is perhaps maybe slightly facile. Um, but if you, um, if you have chest pain, so Lucia, Pete has chest pain. You know, he comes in with chest pain, he's got a bit of chest pain, he feels a bit sick, you know, he's, uh, he's not looking too clever, he's got a bit of a headache mainly, you know. So you've got a few treatments that you could use. Do you want to go straight for some kind of cardio perfusion, cardiac reperfusion? Do you want to... Give him some antibiotics. A little bit of Gavin's gone. What do you think? Um, what would you... History and do uh, ABC. Make sure you yeah. <laughs> So this is... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I stopped doing general medicine a long time ago, but, you know... Um, <laughs> so, I, so I'm not quite sure what to do here either. But, but, but I seem to remember on day one of medical school, they told me that it, that it matters... The anatomy matters. Medicine's kind of about anatomical, clinical correlations, Right? So to decide what to do, you kind of want to know where the pain's coming from. You want to know whether it's coming from the heart or the lungs or the stomach, and whether it's an infection or whether it's an MI. Um, and that mapping is sort of what medicine is, as far as I'm concerned. And I think sometimes we, we miss that a bit with, uh, um, with concussion. So if we have a head injury, um, so, so Richard told me that the problem, we, we need a term to replace concussion. You know, we need to have some other word that's a catch-all. I would be perfectly happy to use the term head injury, to just to say that somebody's had a head injury. Um, and then we try and work out what we want to do with them. Now, what we don't do is we don't go straight for neurosurgery, you know, because we want to work out whether there's a brain injury or not. You know, so we do some tests. You know, we look at, uh, um, we look at, at, uh, uh, at some imaging. We do some vestibular assessment. We try and work out phenomenological whether this is a migraine. And then that leads down very different routes as to what we might want to do. Um, and of course, I, you know, I'm being slightly uh, silly with this. Um, but I think it's an important point. This is why it matters, because it leads to very different management. Um, now, I mentioned David's book. This is a plug for, for David's book. I've, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, uh, um, this is a great book. I carry this book in my bag. You know, it's full of, of honestly, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, it, it's full of great advice. It's a very practical, pragmatic approach to the management of symptoms after, after head injuries. Um, and David is an excellent physician who, who, who is incredibly committed and careful about the management of these symptoms. Uh, yeah. He's also just moved to, or moving to Washington, so he needs the royalties. Um, so I would, uh, you know, I would definitely recommend getting the book. Um, the, the problem is not... There's only one David Brody in the world. You know, not everybody is like that. You know, so, and, and, and I think one of the problems with, uh, with the use of the term concussion is the, is, is, the, is the cognitive biases, if you like, that this leads to in terms of the way that you deal with the patients. Right? Bear in mind that the baggage of the term concussion is this is transient, it will go away, it doesn't lead to long-term problems, there are no neuroimaging um, associations with it. So this is not a problem for you in clinic. Um, so this is um, uh, an example of, a, of an interaction that I think is, is, is not uncommon. I have to say, you know, among my colleagues. So a patient might come in and say, I feel terrible. I had a head injury a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. And I've had awful dizziness or headache or memory problems since then. The neurologist will say, I know what you've had. It's a concussion. Um, and, uh, and the patient might say, well, why do I still feel bad? And you also say, because you've had a post-concussive syndrome. This is post-concussive syndrome. And the patient will say, well, what's that? And then you will say, well, it's what happens after you've had a concussion. <laughs> and the patient will then usually say, well, are you going to do anything about it? And then you're saying, no, you don't need to do anything because it's going to get better. Um, and the patients will look confused and leave and be unhappy. And the neurologist will normally be happy because this has been very, very short. Um, <laughs> no, and, uh, you know, if you've got 30 patients in your clinic, you know, this is, uh, this is done in a minute, you know. Um, so, 
this is, you know, this, this is an issue. I think the availability of a term that carries with it so much baggage of, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a lack of severity um, is a problem. And I, I realize that the, the, this facet of it is probably very different in different contexts. You know, if you go to David's clinic in, uh, in Wash U or whatever, it's, it's, it, you know, you're not going to get this experience. If you go to a clinic in uh, um, uh, somewhere else, uh, <laughs> then, uh, then it might be. Um, okay, so last, last, last couple of slides. Um, so this is from our, our, our review. I'm not going to go through this, but the point of this is there's lots of treatment, there's lots of things you can do. You know, my, my, my neurological colleagues in the UK say, well, I started to do this. They kind of said, well, why, why do you want to do traumatic brain injury? There's nothing you can do. Um, you know, there's, there's no, you know, there's nothing you can do for these patients. I mean, that's completely untrue. There's lots of options, which are very nicely laid out in, in, in David's book. Um, uh, so you could take the approach of trying to pick apart what's the cause of these people's symptoms, which have very different management plans. Or you could just get out your stamp and say they've got post-concussive syndrome uh, and move on to the next patient. And I think that's, you know, that's uh, from a very pragmatic kind of point of view, that's one of the issues I have that uh, uh, that becomes a problem. Okay, so in summary, I, I think concussion is a useful lay term to describe a constellation of symptoms that occur after a head injury. But in a neurological or in a medical context, I think it's problematic. Um, I think the availability of post-concussive syndrome or post-concussive headache, post-concussive vestibular problems, post-concussive whatever it is, um, is, is difficult. I think it induces a diagnostic laziness. In, uh, in physicians, that in a neurological context, I find it ex astonishing sometimes. You know, actually, a patient coming into a, a neurological clinic, typically in the UK, with a headache, will 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 spend a long time dissecting out that headache, trying to work out exactly what phenotype it is, exactly what the management should be. A patient coming in who says, "Well, I had a head injury three months ago," has exactly the same symptoms. The neurologist will just say, "Well, this is a post-concussive headache. Um, it's going to get better, so off you go." Um, I, I, I kid you not, that happens, um, and, uh, I, and I, that's something that's problematic. Um, so I don't think it has any distinct pathological features, and I think the assumption that persistent pathology is absent is wrong. Um, I think there are no distinct clinical features that allow you to distinguish between concussion and traumatic brain injury, and I think that concussion can lead to long-lasting effects. So I, I proposed that we should retire the term concussion. Um, I'm very happy to say somebody's had a head injury, um, but I think we should try and classify the severity of uh, the underlying traumatic brain injury as well as we can, which is often very imprecise, using a method like the Mayo system. Uh, and then we should focus on the actual symptoms and try and produce a diagnostic formulation that uses all the available information and then produces a, a specific management plan for that patient. Um, that's it. Great, thank you very much, David. Um, so, Lee, it's your turn. Okay, So, good. it's time to return fire. Yeah. Fire at will, I guess. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I certainly I, I appreciate the opportunity here, and I, I know how foolish it was to have set this uh, up as the straw dog uh, with your argument. And clearly, Dave, you should have been the one sitting in, in this chair. Uh, but but, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it on nevertheless. So, so the, the other side of this is that um, we've just completed a big study trying to differentiate uh, con what, what I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call concussive-like uh, uh, syndrome from TBI with the explicit goal of actually coming to the same practical outcome that you're trying to achieve here. So while I agree with you in the overarching, um, uh, uh, the, the difficulties that we have with the term and that, we, that it presents clinically. I, in fact, that was the whole motivation for the work is that I can't stand the way uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is moved in the clinical realm. And importantly, the way stakeholders have utilized this imprecision uh, to promote particular types of arguments, particularly related to sports. There, there's, there are other agendas for pushing uh, uh, this confusion. And we seem to be uh, expert at this on the other side of the pond of exploiting confusion and uh, gray areas uh, to promote particular types of ends. And um, I think that's part of what's happening here and why this has come to the fore. So I have to grab my notes since I did this all last night. And um, I think I have, let's see, how do I move on here? Yeah. yeah. So give me another second to formulate uh, a response, of course. Because, is it 
date this one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Okay. So, um, so this is um, uh, uh, borrowing uh, uh, for, from from this very distinction that uh, uh, Dave was just talking about. So, um, first off. It is in common parlance, and it has been for a long time, and it's been imprecisely used precisely because it is a lay term. It is, um, uh, we, we have management manual, manuals for concussion, but the distinction between a traumatic brain injury uh, and concussion is, is incredibly confused. And I would argue that one of the main reasons it is uh, confusing is because of a category error, and this is just what we're, we're talking apples and oranges, and this is, uh, it's a logical error. It is a, it is a fallacy that has uh, been uh, well established in other, in other domains, and, and I'm, I'm going to try to parse this um, in ways that are still confusing uh, to me. But uh, let, let's, we have a perfectly good word. Um, it's known in, uh, even amongst uh, lay people. We have a vague understanding of what this is even before we've had any medical training uh, whatsoever. And I think to just say, um, uh, to get rid of it, one, it's not going to happen. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, it is actually useful if we define what it is precisely and we as experts in the field or, uh, or teachers and clinicians uh, that we clarify what we mean when we mean uh, when these words are said. And I think that's really the crux of, of the issue in getting around the category mistake. And I'll spend some, uh, uh, a, a moment on this uh, now. So um, the category mistake is, or the category error, the category um, uh, fallacy, is when we take attributes from one domain and attributes from another, and they share some common attributes, right? But they are actually distinct phenomena. This is a, a, a classical logical error. Uh, Gilbert Ryle has talked a great uh, deal about this. And um, it, it's kind of encapsulated uh, by a, a famous story that he uh, tells about a, a visitor to Oxford. Uh, I'm sure many of you know this story, or maybe not. I'll just explain it to you. So the visitor comes, and he's uh, uh, taken to all the, um, all the colleges. He goes to the library. He sees all the uh, um, landmarks in Oxford. And at the end of this uh, day of uh, touring the town, he asks, but where is the university, right? And, and, and this really crystallizes the issue. It's, it's an epistemological issue. I'm sorry, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry Steve uh, had, had pointed out, are you going to go philosophical on this? In fact, I am because that is the crux of the issue. So the confusion there, right, is that um, the f uh, physical structures, uh, the things that, was, that were uh, shown, are confused with uh, a university organization or an administrative organization. And that confusion uh, uh, brought the visitor uh, 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 the, the quizzical look on his face when he's faced with seeing uh, Oxford, the University of Oxford, uh, but confusing the buildings uh, with uh, the organization of, of the university. And I think that's really what we have here. And if we are able um, uh, to help uh, shape uh, what we mean precisely by this word, and actually in many ways demote the importance of concussion as a neurological syndrome, I think it's still helpful because when our patients come to us or when it, uh, these things are described, they mean something around this and then it's our job to unpack it. The problem is it's loaded. I, this I will have to give you for certain is that this is a loaded concept and a loaded word and it's used for all sorts of different uh, purposes. So um, let's, let's start with exactly where you were with this, um, uh, Dave, uh, with, with the notion of a concussion. And we don't have to go through all the elements of this, but we, can s we know that it has some relationship temporally. When we use the term, even in the vernacular, we know that it has some temporal relationship uh, to an injury, as you, as you uh, clearly showed um, uh, in, 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 in the movie, and we all know it kind of when we see it. There are other terms that we use uh, in a similar way. De delirium is an inpatient uh, psychiatrist uh, seeing um, a, a delirium. Uh, we have a similar type of problem. We have an alteration in mental status. There's usually an antecedent event, but we don't often know what it is. In fact, in many ways, it's more confusing in the hospital because often we think it is an antecedent event and it turns out to be something else altogether. And our job there is, not, is, is to look at what we see before us, a patient who has had a change in mental status. And then it is our job to unpack that 
by really honing in. And I think uh, Dave Brody's book, uh, I think everybody would be in agreement that when we're presented with someone who says they've had a concussion or allegedly has a concussion, we as clinicians um, who are attending to these patients, it is our job to unpack that. What do you mean by that? What, do you, what exactly is, is going on? And I think often we'll find uh, that uh, what is uh, alleged to be a concussion uh, may, may or may not be a traumatic brain injury. And what I would argue is that um, uh, uh, what we need to do is to take the term for what it is, which is an indication that there's a change in mental status, that there has been some head injury related to the event temporally. And usually what we mean by that is a close temporal locking. And I, I want to take out of this uh, the post-concussive syndrome and the later term, uh, the later sequelae of, of these head injuries. And let's just focus on the word concussion. I could not agree with you more about post-concussion syndrome and the host of other sequelae that come from these head injuries. It's very problematic. But for the moment, let's just attend to what happened on the ball field that you were showing up here. And we, there was a, clearly there was a hit and clearly there was a change in mental status. And what we can talk about there is distinguishing that from the injury. And I think that's really the crux of the issue. And it's the crux of the issue in, in the United States with the NFL paying attention to uh, the concussion. So I would argue that if we put the concussion is just a descriptor, just a descriptor of a relationship of a hit and an, a very tight temporal locking to a change in mental status as just a descriptor like chest pain. I'm having, it is just simply a descriptor and it's describing a temporal locking with a change in neurological status. That does not take our obligation away from figuring out what that is. It may or may not be related to a brain injury, but it's a decoupling of the brain injury that we may or may not find and the neurological symptoms that we see immediately in the aftermath of these injuries. And if we were to leave this, because it is something that people describe that we look at and say that it is simply what you were showing, a hit and a change in mental status, and now our work begins, do they have a brain injury or not? They may, they may not, we need to attend to them regardless, but they're different categories of descriptions of events. And I think if we were to do that, if we were to decouple it, um, then I think we would be, uh, stand in good stead to be able uh, uh, to distinguish these things. And this is actually quite important because um, in the United States, for example, the NFL is claiming that concussion, uh, they're, they're drawing this uh, distinction between what's happening on the ball field and relating uh, uh, the effects of concussion to these long-term sequelae. Well, we and others uh, um, have shown that they are not coupled. They are not coupled. What is coupled is getting hit repeatedly, whether or not you have had a concussion. And this is the overwhelming uh, data that come out of our brain injury uh, cohort, our neuropathological uh, uh, cohorts, uh, and now from our animal work, is that these things are not directly coupled. That is, the neurological syndrome or the incidence of, being, of having these neurological sy uh, syndrome um, it does not correlate with the pathology. And, and uh, this needs to be decoupled. So um, we, we know that it is the exposure to the hits and the physical injuries to the brain, not the concussion itself. And so if we can decouple that and just describe what we're seeing and then look for the injury, I think we would be doing our patients um, a, a great service. Again, to underscore this idea that they are distinct phenomena. It's not whether a concussion is an injury or not. It's just a descriptor of a, of a response uh, 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 to an injury. And we can argue about what, what, what that means and what the physiology uh, of this um, is. And I think it, it is similar to uh, the heart attack example. Because there, if someone comes into our emergency room and they are complaining of chest pain, this would be the equivalent of giving away, uh, you can't, we, we can't trust chest pain. It, it's, um, uh, we, we would work that up. It might be 
um, uh, uh, anxiety, it might be uh, uh, GERD, it could be any number of things, we would work it up. But to say, let's get rid of chest, calling it chest pain would be ridiculous. This is something people experience. And although we don't know the source of it, it is a syndrome that we are familiar with clinically that requires working up. And I would argue that concussion falls in that same category. And we should be as suspicious of what the cause of it is as we are with chest pain. When someone comes into a clinic and they are complaining of chest pain, we are very suspicious of what they often allege that chest pain was caused by. We work it up. And so if we use it as a descriptor that this was related to an injury, I think it, 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 th th that's, where, that's really where, where, where we should start. Um, the other reason I think we need to keep it, uh, keep this uh, conception, is um, that it is describing some type of uh, disorder of, of consciousness uh, that I cannot get at with our animal models. And um, this remains one of the great enigmas in experimental neurology. What is consciousness? We had this, uh, uh, David Menon and I and uh, Juliet had this discussion last night, and uh, 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 we, were, we were talking about this last night. And um, when we talk about concussion, the very wording of concussion um, uh, uh, indicates some change in, in level of consciousness. And I think by keeping this term, we are adhering to that uh, thought that, uh, that uh, understanding what is uh, going into uh, uh, consciousness is really, is, is really an important matter. And that's apart from the, from, from the clinical uh, realm. So I want to conclude by saying that um, I would agree with, with David in many, in many respects. It's a sort of straw man uh, argument uh, in, in some ways. Uh, but in others, it is, it is quite distinct. And I, our, our data to date uh, suggest that a concussion can be, if we look at it, is just that temporal locking of a neurological syndrome uh, that's associated with, uh, with, 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 a, with an impact uh, to the head. Um, that is a distinct neurological syndrome that we see even when we move the head the same way but uh, imply the energy differently, we get a different type of neurological response. That is no neurological response. So I think I very quickly went over yesterday. When we move the head like we did with uh, BLAST, uh, we, we don't get a neurological syndrome. But we do get a neurological syndrome in our animals that looks remarkably like uh, human uh, uh, concussion uh, after an impact. And this has to do with the, how the energy is loaded into the head. Uh, we, we have a paper that hopefully uh, uh, we'll get out uh, relatively soon on this very topic. And so that we can see a different loading um, uh, uh, even when the head is moving the same and we get a different neurological syndrome out of that, it implies that we should actually pay attention to this as something that might be clinically useful. Doesn't mean we don't have to unpack it, of course we do. But that we can distinguish those um, uh, two types of syndromes, I think, uh, argues for uh, uh, keeping uh, the, um, uh, uh, the term. The point of this is that this does not absolve us of the responsibility of, of then looking to find out who is injured and who is not. Who has a brain injury that is structurally uh, altering the function um, uh, or, or the structure of the brain? And that we really need. And for that, we need the markers, either imaging or blood markers, that are going to tell us not who's had a concussion, but who's had an injury to the brain. And that is really where we need to be. And um, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, at the end of the day here, um, what we want is something that we can pick up, something like, like this, or a, a DTI. This, this happens to be from Alain uh, Friedman's uh, work, and this is a, di a, a dynamic uh, contrast-enhanced uh, MRI. And, and what we're looking at here is in a, a set of, I showed this yesterday, uh, a, a season of, of play. And some of these uh, uh, athletes um, have uh, a, a, a traumatic microvascular injury. And we've now studied these same a group of patients, we're putting this paper together right now, a year later. And I can tell you that about a third of these uh, folks um, are completely resolve. Okay? So they, they no longer have the traumatic microvascular injury. Some of the, about a third of them uh, stay about the same. And about a third of them get worse. And this probably is not surprising in the clinical setting. That's roughly what we see. Some people get better. Some people stay about the same, and a smaller percentage uh, uh, actually get worse. But this is a marker of an endophenotype of this type of injury. So rather than focusing on concussion, 
what we really need to focus on is the biomarkers that tell us whether there's injury. And then these are, as Ramon uh, mentioned earlier today, uh, then we can go after and treat this into phenotype as opposed to another. Okay. So um, in conclusion, I would say it's foolish to get rid of the, uh, the word concussion because it's in the common parlance. I don't think it's going to happen. And, I, uh, uh, and, and frankly, I think it's going to continue to be used and, very importantly, misused. Um, what I think we need to do is demote the importance of the word and then unpack what people mean when they use it. Clinically, what we should do, I think we should not confuse it with traumatic brain injury. And I, and I think it's a mistake to do so. And I also think it's a mistake uh, uh, to delegitimize some of these injuries by calling them mild. I think we're all in agreement with that. We have this uh, uh, problem in Alzheimer's disease with mild cognitive impairment. And, and uh, we have patients who come to us regularly. Uh, this has happened in my own family, uh, coming to us, and, and, we're, and we're told that our loved one has mild cognitive impairment. And this is not what you want to hear for any uh, stretch, for, by any uh, uh, means, uh, because I wouldn't be in the office if it were mild. So, so uh, it, it, it's really uh, dispiriting and uh, absolves us of a lot of responsibilities as, as clinicians. I wouldn't be in your office if, I, if this were a mild impairment. So it's a traumatic brain injury, and we need a way to figure that out. It's like uh, we, we do this in cardi it, we, as a medical field, we do this in cardiology. It's not uh, whether you've had a myocardial infarction. We say where it is, what it is, how much it is, and then we describe the functional deficits that ensue. We don't. Uh, you know, categorize them uh, in, in these simple categories. And I would argue that we need to do exactly the same thing with, with, our, uh, uh, with, with our brain injuries and, and the way that we um, uh, work up uh, a, a cardiac, dis, uh, cardiac dysfunction in the setting of a myocardial infarction. So getting rid of the word I don't think is going to happen. Um, and so I think we're, le and we're left with a neurological phenomenon that needs an explanation. There's no question uh, that, uh, that something happens neurologically after some hits. Uh, just as we are certain that things happen uh, in, in a seizure or in a delirious patient, these are descriptors of neurological phenomena, and we can't just throw them, in, uh, uh, throw them away. What we can throw away is imprecision in the language, and that's what I would suggest that we do, that when we talk about concussion, we just restrict it to um, a, a phenomenological descriptor, and we distinguish that from uh, traumatic brain injury. I'm on a, on a mission now to try to decouple uh, the, uh, uh, thinking that concussion is the same thing as mild traumatic brain injury. And I, I'd have to agree with uh, Dave uh, on this, um, if that's exactly what, if, if that's partially what you're trying to say. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of confusion in the field about concussion being, yeah, so maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm altering your argument. But, uh, the, um, but, but, but if it's so, that's what I'm doing. But um, uh, in any case, in any case, I think they do need to be decoupled. And, 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 we, we, and we leave this as a descriptor of neurological uh, phenomenon, and then we, 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 we do our workup. So um, with that, I think I'll just uh, say thank you very much, for, uh, and uh, I'll close there. Thanks. Um, okay, great. You both flagrantly disregarded the 15 minute rule. Um, oh, yeah. Is that a filibuster in America or something like that? Um, so, first question. So, we've got loads of good questions here. So, first question. You, you're doing questions first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't opened up the final poll yet. Okay. So, I think let's start with the biggest question first. This is probably for you, Dave. If we retire the term, what are we going to call the Hollywood film concussion? Really bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which he was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would go further. I would even say bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> this was supposed to be a PG event. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not anymore. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, we've got a we've got a couple of very interesting comments and questions actually surrounding this idea of language being important in the way we interact with patients and how our, the way we use our language dictates uh, the, the course of our patient's therapy. So for example, is traumatic brain injury a more distressing term for patients? Does it over-medicalize uh, what they're suffering? On the other hand, can we use perhaps traumatic, can we use the word concussion and mild TBI interchangeably depending on whether we're trying to strike a balance between acknowledging their suffering, but also trying not to over-medicalize. So from a psychological point of view, uh, for both of you, do you think that using concussion might have fewer negative connotations and a less 
problem-saturated narrative than using traumatic brain injury and therefore help recovery? Um, I, 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 I'll take a... Uh, I'll take a ra rather strong uh, position on that because I think that uh, concussion is actually being used for all sorts of purposes um, to distract us from what might be, uh, uh, might or might not be a, a traumatic brain injury. I mean, in this, in this respect, I, I would say retiring uh, the word concussion as, as, as a diagnosis might, be, might, might, might actually be meaningful as a diagnosis, as a descriptor of neurological phenomena. Uh, 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 not so. Um, I uh, it is it is it's clear to me that if patients are having um, symptoms, they want to be told what it is, and I think by describing the event rather than what's happening in in their uh, brains that we can actually help them with, um, I think is actually confusing to patients. Um, why do we need to um, uh, describe it in categories? Uh, uh, mi mild, moderate, and, and severe. We can just, we can simply just, uh, why do we need the categories um, when, we, when we can describe what is happening to the patients and actually let them know? They know what's, that's why they're there. They, they know that they have these problems and uh, we can help them by uh, putting that together with um, the, the structural injuries without having to resort to uh, concussion to describe it. David? Um, yes, I think it's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, I, I, so I would disagree with um, Lee again about that. I think it's very useful to have a, a, a classification of severity. I think fundamentally, moderate severe, you know, TBI is a different, um, you know, condition that has a very different prognosis, different problems associated with it. So we need to, you know, be able to clinically make a judgment about that. Sure, we're not going to do that precisely all the time. Often we have very limited information. Um, the question is about the exact terminology and how much that matters about how people react to that. Um, um, you know, is, is traumatic brain injury a, a scary term? I mean, you know, potentially, although so are most of our diagnoses. I mean, if you tell a patient they have cancer or they have stroke or whatever, I mean, these are, these, are, these are scary words that people have an understanding of. I don't see, you know, how we can necessarily get away from that. I mean, the flip side of that as to whether the use of the term mild is unnecessarily um, kind of downweighting their injury. You know, I have, you know, more, more sympathy for that position. And it may be that, um, you know, actually, some kind of consensus move towards a more sensible um, and perhaps less emotive grading system might be uh, um, appropriate. Okay, I just want to raise one. Someone astute in the audience has pointed out that, Dave, you are completely out of date. Um, the Berlin consensus was published months ago. Um, <laughs> I actually think this is without showing which side I'm on the argument here, but it's quite interesting. They, if you look at it up, there's about four paragraphs where they uh, discuss what sports-related concussion could be, and they end up saying sports-related concussion is a traumatic brain injury. So uh, there we go. That kind of resolves that. So they have changed. It's true, because in the Zurich consensus, they're yeah. kind of shuffling it away, and now they've come into line with everyone else, which I think just goes to show how much confusion there is. We don't, the definition keeps kind of moving around, which is half the problem. So not at all biased there from our chair. <laughs> um, I've got a, a very upvoted question. Is it possible that with better imaging techniques, and we've all heard a lot about the sort of um, quite sensitive imaging that we can get nowadays, fewer and fewer post-injury scans will be deemed normal, and a non-TBI definition of concussion will be redundant? Um, <laughs> I mean, just, I was, I, so I was, I was a little confused about your kind of formulation at the end about... Uh, separating concussion from TBI. I mean, my point really is that I don't think you can separate it, and I don't think it's appropriate to, to try to. Um, so I think we should view this on a, on a spectrum, uh, and I think it's certainly true that perhaps as we get more sensitive techniques, more pa patients will be classified as having a, a traumatic brain injury. I mean, I, 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 do, I think, although you haven't actually said that, I wonder, you know, I wonder whether you're, you're viewing concussion as a physiological um, event, you know, so, you, so you, you, you know, underlying this is the idea that perhaps um, the impact itself produces, say, a big release of neurotransmitters which produces the problem, and, that, and that's not a brain injury. I mean, I, that, that, I, so, so, I, so, I, so I think that's, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting kind of area as to whether you would say that was a brain injury, because I would say that's, that's 
quite problematic. I mean, if you have a massive release of glutamate, you might well produce excitotoxic mediated cell death or whatever that might trigger off various cascades and produce brain injuries. I'm not quite sure that you can make a distinction like that. Well, well I think this is exactly the point. So, so um, we don't know whether that would uh, cause an injury or not, but that's actually irrelevant to how we classify it. So, so I'm it, it, at the moment, if we just do the temporally locked physiologic response, that is what, in my conception, would be what we mean by concussion. That may or may not be an injury. We don't know. It may always be linked with an injury, or it may only sometimes be linked with an injury, but it is a different category of description because it is, it is in my uh, understanding of this, a category error to try to uh, put the, weld these together. There are different categories of things that we're trying to explain. It, it's a, a logical error. And so um, if we decouple everything that we think about concussion, uh, that is all the other stuff, the movie, everything else, all the ups and downs of concussion, and we just focus on what happened, the change in neurological status, whatever the sequelae may be, then we can, I think we can talk sane about this. The, what happened is that a person gets hit and they have a, res, a neurological response. And there are various ways in which we could capsulize that in the descriptor that we use for concussion or delirium. We have other uh, uh, descriptors that we use for changes in mental status. And they're, they're probably physiologic, uh, physiologic in origin. Let's decouple that from whether they've had a brain injury or not. And let's look and see if we can find it by other uh, markers. Okay, is there any questions or comments from the... Yeah. Oh, just, talk, just talk now. Okay. Well, I, I, I think that's a uh, very interesting debate. Um, but I think some, some of the, the fundamental elements <coughs> in some of the arguments, so first, one of the first things, which I think towards then both of you agreed on, uh, is that we are, we are, we are not just saying structural brain injury, same as traumatic brain injury. So right now, we may not be able to see certain injuries that are there. So but that's the first thing. But the second thing, you know, more importantly, is about um, this notion about having etiological diagnosis of all the symptoms. And, and, and David, you put on you know, the slide about all, all the pain, all the symptoms like depression, anxiety, or positive impairment. But these people are not in PTA. They have, they have recovered from PTA. They're having persistent neurocognitive difficulties. What do we call that? Uh, what do we call uh, the depressive and anxiety symptoms, which are subclinical, they are not depression. Uh, they will not be diagnosed as depression. What do we call that? What do we call the other somatic symptoms, like sensitive to light, light and sound? Well, it's not vestibular. Uh, you know, there's something going on, which is called that. So we won't be able to have a holistic, uh, either holistic diagnosis in any other way, any other term, or individual diagnosis for all the symptoms. So we've got to call it something. So, 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 you, so you would favour calling it post-concussion syndrome at that stage, no, would you? No, in absence of uh, something uh, at the moment, I think the biggest fundamental problem you highlighted is that people take this condition too lightly. It's a serious condition with, you know, often people are left with a bit more persistent symptoms. So fobbing people off from uh, a concentration room is the biggest problem. But people assuming that it will automatically resolve, whereas data suggests that it does not automatically resolve significant proportion of people. I think that's where the biggest change should be, in defining it more clearly and, and learning to do something about that. But in, but in the chronic phase, I mean, I think actually Lee and I were in agreement about that, that, uh, that it's problematic to use a catch-all term in a chronic phase months or years down the line when it's so multifactorial. Um, and I think if you take your examples of anxiety or depression, the neuropsychiatric side, you know, we should be attempting to make a precise neuropsychiatric diagnosis from that situation. If you take photophobia or headaches or whatever, we should be deciding whether or not patients are having migraine, um, which is very, very common because that has a very clear management path. Um, similarly, you know, with anxiety and depression, I mean, many of the patients will respond to SSRIs or other kind of intervention. Um, I think the label of post-concussion syndrome in that particular context is, is, is really problematic. I, mean, I, w I would honestly never use that term, you know, and don't allow any of the trainees to use the term post-concussive syndrome for anybody coming through a clinic that I'm involved in. Um, you know, so I've, I absolutely disagree that that's, the, that that's appropriate to use a, a, you know, a catch-all term like that. Um, yeah. Well, if they're not, then that's not their diagnosis. Um, you know, but maybe they're somatizing, or maybe I mean, maybe they, you know, maybe they, you know, maybe they, just because we don't have 
a precise diagnosis doesn't mean to say we should use a diagnosis that is imprecise. Okay. Uh, one final question, then we're going to have to just uh, formulate one sentence each as your final statement. One sentence. <laughs> Proper punctuation. Honestly, we'll do. Yes. Proper punctuation. Yes. One, one question while we're waiting on that. Uh, oh, wait, the last step, I don't follow. I follow you absolutely every step except the last one. And that is that you're, you're drawing, the, you're making the assumption on that last step that it is, in fact, an injury. It might be. It very well might be. But it is not necessarily so. So we can decouple the, uh, to respond to that, because that, that's, that's the error right there, is there's an assumption built into that step. That's the one I have the problem with. And I'm, it's not to say it is, it is, it has, there's no value judgment on, on where this stands, but it's that leap of faith and that assumption is, 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 is I'm challenging. So it's apparently, it's really about the definition. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Don't do it, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, yes. Sorry, that was our not so subtle way of. Um, yes. Of <laughs> yes. But the final poll is now open. It would be great if you all voted. And I'm going to hand over. Abnormal, you know, an abnormal we, we see that in psychiatry often. Delirium um, delirium's a very good example of this, uh, where we have a disturbance. When we have a disturbance, I, I, I don't know if it's up there, but anyway, uh, uh, and, and I don't want to influence uh, uh, voting on this in any way. Um, uh, but uh, um, uh, I do want to say, I do want to say, though, in a delirious state, in a delirious state, we have you, you, we, we have a change in mental status, and it may or may not be injurious to the patient, depending on what the etiology De is. Delirium is another terrible term. Okay, okay, we are really yeah. going. <laughs> I'll come back. I'll come back. Yeah. We'll come back on. brains will get thrown in a minute. So uh, the final poll is open. Don't let. Just don't it vote. Is, You're not allowed to vote. Um, so please vote for yourself based on your science. Um, there is no. You have to make a decision. This is this is like a referendum. There will be an answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there will be an answer, and someone's going to get chucked out. So um, so Dave and Lee, we're going to hand it over to you. So uh, Dave, as a proposition, you have also, you have one sentence of variable length, followed by Lee one sentence of variable length, and then we'll show you the results. Um, well, I, I think the discussion has, uh, has summed up the confusion, really, around the term. So, uh, um, you know, I think we've done a good job of highlighting the complexities, really. Uh, um, I, just to be clear, I don't think we should. I don't think we we should ban the term concussion from as a lay term. You know, um, and if patients come and say they've had a concussion, our job, I completely agree with you, is to disentangle that. But to then use that in our own formulation. Um, is problematic for me. Um, and, and I don't actually agree that we could never change this either. I mean, you know, so you guys are always changing your terminology, aren't you, in DSM-5 or whatever? I mean, it changes every year. I mean, what, you know... Yeah. I mean, we're, and we you went to yeah. level two. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lee, yeah. final yeah. comment, one yes. sentence. Well, uh, yes, so, so I think this is a problem of terminology and in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, use and misuse of, of the terminology. And I would say, my argument would be uh, that we uh, keep the term as a descriptor with a very, very defined uh, 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 non-value-laden uh, uh, judgment, and that is that it, it relates to this neurological phenomenon that we see. And then it is our job to unpack it to figure out whether they've had a brain injury and what to do about it. Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, so um, personally, I think the most voted for question should is the best way to settle this rather than uh, the poll. Uh, so oh, yeah. we'll, we'll do that in the coffee break. Um, but yeah, the poll has come in, so we're not retiring it just yet, so keep using it. <laughs> All right, time for coffee, and we'll be back again.